Yeah. You're listening to Fresh Out of the Game. And I'd be so fresh. Fresh, fresh Podcast Network. <laughs> Straight from Tel Aviv, Israel. Let's go. Hi, my name is Hilal Leizorovich. And I'm Rana Vaughn. We are two entrepreneurs from Israel. And we are on a journey to find out what makes entrepreneurs, investors, and CEOs succeed or fail. And we hope to inspire your journey. Oh, hello, everybody, and welcome to the TLV DNA show. And today with us is Roy Laor, the Israel General Manager of Open Web. Hello, thank you for having me. Good to be here. Good to have you. So how's it going? Best day of my life. Best no, day of your life. No, no complaints. I'm here Woo! with you. <laughs> What else right. can I ask? So we're starting very, very good. <laughs> All right. Audience is out there listening right now. We're going to start from the beginning of Open Web when you joined the team. Mm-hmm. Tell us a bit how you joined, how you made that decision and became, become uh, one of the founding team. Sure. Um, so when I joined Open Web, it was Spot I am at the time. Um, the company was just pivoting into um, building communities for publishers. Previous product was more around... Um, location-based chats and trying to connect people through their location we understood or rather the founders understood that the context matters if you want to connect people and publishers me going into a, a publisher and, and, and reading their articles says something about my interests and is a good ground to connect people and that's where I, where I joined we started to approach the Uh, publishers I was the first um, business development person in the company um, my, the product was already launched the the product was uh, uh, an MVP was launched mm-hmm. it was very very uh, basic we basically took the location based chat and turned it into an embeddable product for for publishers so it was we I don't think the it was thought well enough about how that would work in that context so it was a simple kind of chat for Like bubble in the corner of every page same exact conversation wherever you are on the site and just clicking and and, and you can see all of the conversations at once okay um, but the context was too wide the that bubble wasn't clickable enough and there's obviously a lot of lessons learned from how we launched and um, and, and and the ideas behind that product and back then it was spot on I am spot I am that was, was the, the brand yes okay um, and at, at the time uh, I joined in to try and get us partnerships with with publishers my previous experience was selling gym memberships probably like two blocks away from where we are right now <laughs> so it was a, a sales experience and I just wanted to understand and, and get a sense of what the tech industry is is about um, I joined founders that I did was very happy to, to learn from and, and to be inspired by so for me it was an, an easy decision um, who are the founders in. founders are Nadav Shoval and at the time it was Ishai Green um, who was very well known mm-hmm. um, uh, Ishai uh, is not no longer with with the companies he left around three years ago I think um, and uh, with me joined Roy Goldberg who was Um, is the co-founder of Nadav and the COO of the company. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I joined them um, and we started to approach uh, publishers with that product and, and, and got a little bit of traction. The word communities m- made sense. People wanted to improve engagement, so they gave us the stage. But as I said, the product didn't really deliver on its promise just yet. And probably, I don't know, week six or week, week eight, something there mm-hmm. uh, of me in the company I was assigned with trying to um, analyze whether comments and, and the idea of, of commenting is the next logical step for us to explore um, which is also interesting I think to understand that when you are in a founding team I came to 
sell and to be an external facing entity in, mm-hmm. in the company. But after six weeks, I found myself doing research and doing something completely different than what I thought I would be doing and what my experience was was all about. And I, um, that ability to shift mentality and to understand what's needed and not what necessarily you thought you'd be doing mm-hmm. uh, is uh, is very important for founders and for startup companies. Um, uh, people have many different hats at, the, at those stages. Um, so uh, my assignment was to understand whether or not commenting was the next uh, step. I took, I think, a very uh, straightforward approach of looking into the competition out there, um, understanding the trends, whether uh, publishers and especially the large ones are more um, are, are, are adopting those, that technology or are, um, <coughs> removing that technology. What I found out is when there was a lot of fierce competition, companies like Discuss and Facebook were um, had commenting platforms that were widely adopted. Uh, on the more top tier side, you had like uh, uh, an Adobe based company that was controlling the market. Um, I also noticed that the trend was downwards. So publishers were removing commenting. So I came back to the um, to the founders and said, I don't think that's the business. Uh, I think um, uh, here, here are all the trends and I think it's, it's not the right decision. Luckily, <laughs> they did not listen to me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, the, and, and the decision was to go into commenting. Um, before... It, Maybe before that decision, we wanted to. They wanted to understand what sparked the the imagination there. What I missed was why are publishers removing commenting? What is the reason? Um, there, are, you're saying here are all these great companies doing great service to these publishers, but they're removing it and choosing none of them. What's wrong? Um, and and uh, that idea sparked a very a deep session of interviews with uh, media executives. I think we interviewed more than 100 media executives worldwide. More than 100. More than 100 media executives worldwide. Um, using all of the possibilities of all of our networks to try and just hear people out. Um, it's part of, I think, uh, the obsessive nature you need to have when you're starting a company. Uh, and understanding that your grit is probably your first tool and first uh, uh, quality that you can utilize and your advantage over everybody else at that point. So that's what we, I think it's also very a very Israeli kind of approach. mentality yeah. and approach. Yeah. Um, but that's what we did and, and we interviewed uh, a, a lot of uh, media executives and they all said roughly the same thing. The cost of managing those communities um, and making sure that the conversation represents our brand and is safe is too high for the value that we're seeing. So it does not make sense for us as a business to host conversations. Conversations are best held on social media. We're content creators. Mm-hmm. That was roughly what we heard from all of them. Um, but I think we understood ahead of time that uh, exporting the community is a... Uh, is a bad decision, is a risk. Why? Um, I, I think um, over time, those content creators, um, it, they're not just about uh, publishing content and, and, and getting uh, traffic back and monetizing that traffic. That is, That was the, uh, the main business model, especially in the social era. But if you really want to succeed and thrive, um, for the long term, you need to have a loyal base of customers. So instead mm-hmm. of trying to serve many people or a lot of people with um, with with just a little bit of service, you, you're supposed to or you should um, cater to your most loyal audience and make sure that they choose you every day mm-hmm. out of awareness and not just because they're scrolling in their feeds and clicking the first thing that they see. Um, and I think that what we saw then um, is now kind of materializing uh, in reality and, and uh, a 
lot of publishers' strategies moving more towards subscriptions and registrations and the deeper funnels rather than, <clears throat> sorry, just uh, just page views and 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 ads. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's what we recognized then that it could be a potential risk for them. Um, and we thought, okay, so if we can solve this one problem, if we can help publishers manage their communities with less effort and keep their communities safe. Uh, are are you going to adopt our product? That was our question to all these media executives, and it was a firm yes all across the board. Mm-hmm. And that's what when we were convinced that's what we need to do. Um, and from there, the focus of the company shifted from solely engagement to moderation and safety of of communities, and that's where <clears throat> our competitive advantage. Um, that's where we took our competitive advantage, and it really paid off with time. Great. So after talking to all these people in the media industry, you understood uh, or your edge was, uh, you know, uh, give, you gave birth to your edge. Mm-hmm. And then you went on the journey to actually pivot your product mm-hmm. and create a new MVP or was it already creating a new version or a, be- a beta version? Yeah, so we, the first version was uh, an MVP, a very, very early MVP. And because of all those hundreds of interviews, it was not hard for us to find design partners <clears throat> and big ones and important ones. Um, so for us, it was uh, both a, a huge challenge to try to have your first MVP on such a big stage, um, but also... Uh, a, a huge opportunity and we recognized that opportunity and we went into a three months marathon uh, for the entire company of trying to um, gather the requirements of that first MVP understand what we really really need give birth to that MVP and launch it on that on those design partners um, and the first at first it was it was hard I mean the 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 tools that you need to keep a community safe um, are very complicated. They were not out there anywhere. And we had ideas, but we didn't know if they're going to work. At first, not all of them worked. And for some communities, we experienced almost an explosion mm-hmm. at, at first glance. Um, some of those design partners, we had to work years to get, gain their trust back. Mm-hmm. But for some of them, it really worked out. And it made a significant change in their business. Um, and the, the response was so incredible that we understood um, that this is the direction, not only that this is something that we um, are ready to take out of the MVP stage, but also we need to start expanding it quickly right, and expanding our, our client base quickly. So out of that, the understanding that um, one of us needs to move to New York where media is mostly based mm-hmm. and start having feet on the ground today it almost sounds uh, ridiculous right <laughs> like and uh, where, where everybody's working from home um, <laughs> but at the time it was uh, the, the most logical step we wanted to get FaceTime with people and uh, get the feedback directly and um, and mostly uh, start to build our networks within the media industry um, so I um, moved to New York and I um, It was incredible and, <laughs> and, and, and crazy. Let's just pause there before you tell yeah. the story about New York. Of course. I just want to, you know, sum it all up. So you actually took advantage of the conversation that was already handled with, uh, with uh, uh, media executives, mm-hmm. right? And marketing-wise, you started to recruit design partners out of that list of people because you already had an open door and the conversation was held. Yeah. And then uh, these, was the f- these, was, these were the first ones that actually came on board after the pivot MVP. Mm-hmm. And then you understood some things you need to fix in the product mm-hmm. or change in the product. Yep. Um, some of them left. Some of them stayed. Mm-hmm. And then you got to a point when you understood you need to scale up and have more clientele. Yes. That's when you decided to move to New York. Yes. So <clears throat> there's obviously a lot of, like this, we're, we're saying it here quickly, but these are 
years of, of hard work. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that we understood is that in order to really support these communities, we need to expand our products uh, offering. In order to do that, we need to raise money uh, and, and spend time building. In order to do that, we need to show that there's uh, market interest. And that's why we decided to expand our, our client base and, and focus on that. Um, which is what initially I came for. So it made made sense for me to be the first one to move to New York. All right. So you're coming to New York and then what? You're starting to knock on doors like <laughs> CNBC, uh, CNN door, whatever. What, 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 what do you do? So exactly, exactly that. Um, we started by trying to utilize our, our networks um, and just trying things out. I mean, we none of us had experience in doing business development in New York before. Uh, none of us uh, had the personal connections in, in that space. Um, we had some in the Tel Aviv, or, um, Tel Aviv startup mm -hmm. ecosystem that helped us kind of get the first steps in. Uh, but it was basically um, all predicated on our will, grit, uh, hard work, uh, and and who we are as, as people. And we were able to really connect with um, with people in the industry and, and, and all around it um, and start to open some doors. It, it took time uh, initially. It was There was a shock factor there as well, <laughs> landing in, in New York and um, uh, uh, living uh, by myself. There's no company, there's no office that you go into and like tell people what what's up. Um, mo the time zone differences are like change the entire interaction with with the company so it it, it can um, be also very lonely at times um, but we were so uh, inspired and 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 passionate about what we were doing so it, it didn't really change uh, our course and um, through that we were able to kind of persevere and um, knock on doors as you said and make phone calls and uh, go to conferences and find whatever way we can to get in touch with people um, and show them that we were um, sincere and, 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 and real about our intentions to, to make that work for them, to, to make that product work. I'm sure we can dive uh, deeper into that stage mm -hmm. and try to pull out some insights for other entrepreneurs that mm -hmm. are listening to us at the moment. You know, being there, arriving to New York, being all by yourself, mm -hmm. uh, no office, as you just said, um, what do you do? You know, you say, yeah, you make some phone calls, mm -hmm. uh, you use some connections, you knock on doors. How does that happen? How does that happen where, I don't know, you, you knock on 100 doors and then one of them just opened us up and that, you know, opens up more opportunities. Tell us about how you actually got from zero to, you know, creating more clientele yeah um so at first um i was at the same kind of space that you're probably in right now mm -hmm. trying to figure out what are the first steps what, what do you do um first and i think uh, as my nature is i try to connect with people and ask them and mm -hmm. uh, and see um who's able to to help me and how am i able to help others so that I can start to develop those relationships that in turn will will open those doors. So be it through um, connecting with other Israeli entrepreneurs that have done similar things to, to, to what we're trying to do um, or um, trying to uh, go to conferences and make, make friends. And uh, the thing about New York that um, sometimes uh, people don't think about is that it's a city of, of transplants like everybody moved there even if you're American you moved from somewhere into New York you're there without family probably mm -hmm. and you don't always have a, a, a close group of friends um, and people are, are looking for that connection and sometimes through um, you know the facade of trying to look like you're you have it all figured out it's it's hard to recognize mm -hmm. but if you show people your vulnerability and 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 tell them hey i'm here by myself i don't have any friends i don't have anyone to rely on then they open up as well and, and you're able to create that connection and at at the first step that's all you need like human connections 
mm-hmm. um, is is the, the key to, to open those doors. You don't know how. So be yourself, authenticity, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Um, actually project what you are mm-hmm. and, and use it that people will actually help you. But how did you hunt on, headhunt those people? You're like going on the web, looking for this guy. You say, now I need it. You see, I don't know, uh, other connections that you have through this guy and yeah so uh, linkedin is a is a is a great way to find way to find people and and, tr- and figure out how you can uh, connect to them but also just asking people um and asking people who, who do the, from the industry and the surrounding the industry who do you know that would be the logical next step for me and when you do create that connection through authenticity and through vulnerability then they tend to, to help and people will go out of their way um, to, to help you if they feel like um, one, you're worth helping to and, 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 and two, you're, you're being real with them and, and genuine. And I think uh, that's sometimes missed out um, by, by a lot of entrepreneurs who try to show force and show mm-hmm. that they're, they have, like they're, they're strong and, and have it and not really show where they truly are in the, in the process. Let's progress. You're actually in New York recruiting more media companies to use your um, product. Mm-hmm. And then you do all that because you want to become more eligible for, mm-hmm. um, for investment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you go ahead and to raise money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the first step of that, of the process was trying to understand our product market fit. And I think we find that initial product market fit um, in comments. And then we understood um, that we need to turn this into a business. And that was kind of step two. Um, uh, understanding, really understanding the need, understanding how to um, scale the stuff like the implementation, how the, does the business model, how, uh, how does it make sense to, um, for the, the, the clients. And that was step two. And then um, uh, with that, you can go ahead and start to raise money. You have a business in your hand that um, you can raise real money um, so that you can s- scale this into a, a company, into an operations that um, can turn into a profitable uh, animal mm-hmm. with time. So, so just before you go and raise the money, you actually create a product market fit mm-hmm. and you have a business model. Mm-hmm. Try to elaborate on that. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, they go to the obvious business models. Um, some of these do not work anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, try to elaborate on that, on that, you know, um, sink, sinking a business model to a product market fit. Yeah. Um, so I think that where uh, I think we, we made uh, probably the best decision was understanding that we want complete alliance uh, of interests with with the publishers mm-hmm. uh, with our partners essentially understanding we're in a b2b to c kind of business um, and that our the success of the community depends a lot on the success or, or on the investment that the publishers puts into it and we have to make it worthwhile for them to not just acquire the service but also uh, invest in it and that's why we went with a business model that is an ad based um, the way it works is that we uh, take the space where the community interacts, we monetize it through our own ad network and share the revenues with the, the publisher, with the host. Um, through that, we achieved alignment of interests with them. And, um, and as I said, it was really important to, at the end of the day, uh, for the user, from, from the hat of the user, from the, the eyes of the user, um, the biggest advantage of having the conversation on the publisher and not on social media is the interaction with the publisher itself, is um, being close to the facts, so to speak, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so to really uh, incentivize the publisher to interact and to participate, we had to show them that the more they do that, the more they earn because it, it is times of their, their employees. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Um, so... Um, so that, I, I think that was probably our smartest decision early, early on when it comes to the business model. Um, so you actually and, created and we stuck to it. So you actually created a net, an, an ad network of mm-hmm. advertisements 
right? Yeah. But that's that's a new customer. A new customer. <laughs> that's a new customer on board. It's a new customer, which um, is a, is a new operations, which is another field which we had no idea about. And this is a real new dimension. No, no in knowledge. Your product. Yes. Uh, so uh, we we understood very fast that the world of um, of advertising and, and, and ad tech is very complicated. Um, uh, it is filled with a lot of um, middle middlemen uh, mm-hmm, at the time, mm-hmm. more so than today even. Um, and we understood that we need someone in the company to help us navigate through that, to help us build that business ground up. Um, and that was step one in that sense. Um, but even before we started to actually materialize the world of advertising, we had to make sure that the business model makes sense, right? For, yeah. for the publishers, um, through for investors. Um, so we, we did a lot of that. We um, interviewed publishers again, um, understood the expectations when it comes to how much money they, they would um, uh, gain from that, the, the, the potential conflicts of interest. Um, as an example, um, one of the first things that we learned is that we cannot sell directly the publisher's domain to the advertisers before we even knew what that meant mm-hmm. because we're essentially competing with their sales team. And that creates a uh, uh, conflict of interest, which we that was our intention in the first place, not to create that. So we understood that we have to go another route and sell different audiences. Um, and and that was that was the stage where we decided to materialize the ads business, um, and we hired a professional, someone who has done this before, um, but still in a very entrepreneurial mindset, still um, uh, young, mm-hmm. and still um, um, uh, it, it wants to experience the growth and the hectic experience of uh, building a startup. Um, and they helped us uh, uh, kind of build that from from the ground up. So to create the ad network of the, this this whole dimension of your product, mm-hmm. when we said it's a new customer, you actually uh, went to hand on t- uh, a talent that t- can actually build it ground up and join the company. Yeah, there there are some things that you are able to. Um, I, I mean, we had the experience of of like building products for users in the company. The, the founder of the company, Nadav, has built uh, forums and chats since he was 14. But was never in the ad tech industry. He was never in the ad tech <laughs> industry. And, and, and it's a very complicated uh, industry for us. It, we also, none of us were very passionate about that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had to, um, we felt like we had to have some help with, from someone who really loves it and knows it and, and all of that. And, and through the years, I, uh, I understand um, the charm of that industry more so than uh, than I did then. Mm-hmm. Um, it was uh, like I didn't want to deal with ads. <laughs> no, ads, no right? ads, no ads for me. Yeah. All right, <laughs> so you have a product. You create the new dimension of that, you know, advertising to monetize the entire operation and yeah. and you know have a business model that actually works. Mm-hmm. And then you go into fundraising. And then we go into to fundraising. This uh, is your first round? No, we we, we raised um, uh, on an spot I am on spot I am before, um, and we had the um, the luck and uh, Nadavs and, and Nishais at the time uh, connections and, and ability to to really instill trust in our first investors, so they wanted to follow up on their first investment. Um, at the time, uh, it was also more common to in, uh, get investments on growth, on user growth, and not just re- uh, revenue growth. Mm-hmm. To, I don't think you can raise a dime today without having a business model yeah. that you can at least articulate and explain why it makes sense. And uh, at the time, we we were able to do that. We said, yeah, it'll be something with ads. You'll see. <laughs> but well, we didn't really know. Um, and, and at the time, it, it was... It was uh, it was okay, but when we wanted to really scale the company, we needed a bigger, healthier round that also included um, more, uh, I don't know, industri- industrialized investors. Um, then we we had to prove the the validity of the business model first. 
So you did it. So so we did do that. Yes, we tell us a bit about numbers before you go into fundraising and want to you know raise that round. What what numbers did you aim for? So it was mainly around um, the user growth and our uh, the the amount of pu- partners that we are able to to convert, but also what can we um, what can we get out of uh, advertisers and. Um, and like our CPMs and stuff like that and um, try to kind of build that calculation in the investor's head of how his money will turn into a lot more money in the future, right? <laughs> so but basically, how does this t- uh, turn from a um, zero dollar business with an idea of a business model into a, a hundreds of millions and potentially billions of dollars business in the future? On the papers. On the papers. So a lot of entrepreneurs are listening right now and they say, I don't know, when am I eligible for funds? When do I need to go and raise funds? And do I have this, you know, data that will go through and digest through due diligence process of any VC? They they, they usually don't have a, a clue. Yeah. I, I, I think at first, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to like every entrepreneur out there that is considering raising funds. Uh, the first step is to question whether or not you want to raise that, those funds first. True. Um, and I mean, the, the, the trend or the conversation around entre- entrepreneurialism, sorry, um, is uh, sometimes shallow in the sense that, yeah, just raise a bunch of money and then you can live like a billionaire with a jet and a golden watch. And I think that's not the that's not the right right way to go. It also does not uh, turn into a business that way. It's just you're just raising money. Um, so I think the the later you can start raising money, the better. Uh, st- having said that, the first rounds are always about the people, less about um, the business, um, and even less so about the revenue or growth at the, the, that specific time. Usually there are no. Um, every investor I know uh, expects a pivot when they invest in a company like early, early, early stage, a seed round or, or even an A round. Um, so uh, it's really about the people. And those are also like, uh, most of the times your most loyal and most um, close investors as mm-hmm. well because mm-hmm. they they root for you from day one. They believe in you from day one, regardless of how you're doing. Um, so, yeah. All right. So you're going into fundraising. Mm-hmm. Um, this is what we're talking about round A at this at this stage. At that stage, it was a round B. B. Yeah. All right. And then how much do you raise? We raised $25 million at the time. From a VC or was it multiple VC? From, from a few VCs and um, some private investors as well. Insight nice. is uh, the leading investor at that. All right. That By that time, you already have offices in New York. You're already operating from, from an office. At that time, um, we were operating from a WeWork space. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it was still, we're about six or seven people in New York all of which are around business development or customer success. All right. Um, Yeah. So you're getting the funds. The funds are in the bank account. Now, (laughs) scale. Scale. All right. How do you scale? Yeah. So a lot, uh, like every other stage that we had, a lot of different attempts to to scale and different mindsets that we adopted with time. First, or w- one of those phases were uh, trying to aim for the long tail of the internet. So trying to almost build a machine of self-serving, of a self-serving community. Um, and we tried to figure out whether that could work. Um, we, from a revenue standpoint, it did work. Like the, the, the pitch made sense to almost every publisher, the adoption, the conversions from like first email to actually um, implement a product were un- unseen before, I think, even. Um, but when it came to our product value on those longer tail 
publishers, we felt like it's just not interesting enough. So we're able maybe to scale the like the ad business through that, but we felt like we're missing our identity, almost. Like we're we're not aiming to build communities and to connect people anymore. So we understood that okay, our business is for the bigger brands, more established brands where people um, go to read their news about it could be news or entertainment or auto news or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they go there every day and and and, and they recognize their brand and and they want to be recognized with their brand. And that was. Um, we understood that that was our, our business, uh, which has a lot of different implications uh, from the sa- uh, length of the sales cycle. Uh, instead of uh, an email chain of three emails, it became a negotiation of months. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, the the type of service that it requ- requires, instead of um, service uh, uh, bots and, and, and Zendesk tickets, it had to become phone calls and texts and, and personal connection with people. Um, so uh, once we understood that, the, the scaling of the business went towards that direction of hiring people who are able to um, help us do the same thing that we did, create uh, honest connections with, with uh, uh, people in the industry and partnerships with publishers who are interested in building a, com- uh, a community and investing in it for real um, and man- obviously people who can manage those relationships as well all right so you actually to scale up you actually made a, a growth in the team mm-hmm. recruited a lot more people in the dna you felt they need to have um to to create it like you created it before yeah so uh, the one of the hurdles um in the way it was the first non-israeli employee because it's the first time that you um have a like deeply different culture within your your company um and your expectation of what who who is a at the time spot i am now an open web member or employee um we prefer a team member <laughs> um so your expectation of who that is had to had to change um and it was really hard to to kind of swallow at first the difference in, in cultures it, it was a struggle and I, I remember when we consulted with other uh, founders Israeli or not um, they told us like yeah that's it's a challenge but you have to stick to it and um, you're not going to be able to scale the business unless you figure out a way to 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 have a diverse diverse team especially uh, when they're just for the example, American, and they, they, they even know it better than us or, or even a lot better than, than what we know. They do a, a lot of things a lot better than, than how we did them. Um, I think Israelis are really good at kind of figuring it out on the, on the cuff, sort of, um, and um, dealing with unknowns, um, probably more so than the average uh, uh, New Yorker. But when it comes to creating processes that scale and building um, procedures and building a culture that is sustainable, um, they, they have a lot to t- we have a lot to learn from them. Mm-hmm. And, and we are every day. <laughs> so you bring them in, you learn. We're going forward in the journey. Mm-hmm. You, you, you know, you bring in the round B, there's 25 million, you scale up, you grow your team, you grow the entire company. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it still has, does it still have headquarters in Israel or is does everybody, you know, merging with New York? Yeah, the, the headquarters and, and the development team in Israel is, um, is still there and forever will be. Uh, first of all, be, because we love Israel and, um, and it's important for us to have our at least one leg. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, uh, to have a, a large team here and, and support the industry and mm-hmm. be a part of this industry. Um, but also, we could not have done this any other way, I think. Like, I, I know that there are many different solutions from like outsourcing teams in Eastern Europe, maybe cheaper solutions somewhere globally, but 
um, culture wise and uh, the the professionalism and as I said the ability to to navigate through the unknown is so crucial at that stage um, and and honestly in every stage so we, I don't think we will ever uh, kind of give up on 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 our core team in Tel Aviv in Israel in Israel all right so how does the startup actually progress from there you scale up you create more clientele is it around the the domestically USA area are you like going bazoom all over the place like international wise yeah so one of the challenges at that stage of a startup is focus um, this is the part where you, you um, the uh, the shift happens between From trying to get more opportunities uh, and go and see what else you can do and kind of send your arms and legs everywhere to you getting bombarded with opportunities <laughs> uh, it's very uh, fun and like you, you feel like um, I heard I worked hard for this and it, it, it feels nice you feel the market fit you feel them exactly you feel the market fit you feel the click mm-hmm. that, um, that you, you just feel the need and Um, but from the uh, uh, other side of it, if you don't stay focused and if you don't really um, stay loyal to what you are here to do, then you can easily lose your way and give room for competition to come um, uh, or, or not uh, be aware of industry changes that change everything. So, so how do you make a decision? You know, we're in this uh, global era where people, mm-hmm. products are digital web applications when you scale up you say wow you know what do I have to lose why not go in into Japan as well but at the end of the day we know that there's a big difference but to penetrate a US market North America mm-hmm. South America penetrate Europe is so different with each each country there has different language or whatever it is mm-hmm. not talking about you know the Far East and in, 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 in APAC mm-hmm. Asia yeah yeah How did you make a decision? Um, it, it, again, it wasn't, wasn't easy and there was always opinions here and there. And uh, every opportunity that comes, there is someone who wants to, wants to go after it. But um, it was mostly the direction that we got, both from our investors, but mainly from, from the CEO who, who insisted that we stayed focused and, and that we... Um, That we go after what we do and try to try to improve on that um, also we weren't and we still aren't um, uh, content with where our product is and where we where the conversation is we always want to improve and and double down on that and I think there's still so much room for growth there um, so that's that's um, that was what led our decision to to stay focused and Uh, having said that at this stage of, of, of our startup where we're um, uh, really growing in our revenues and it seems uh, that the machine so to speak is is working you do have to start thinking about where does this machine max out and what is the the, the next big thing um, and and this this is what um, is on our minds uh, today all right So we get to this uh, present stage of yours when <laughs> yes. you actually, like you just said, you want to know what's the next step. Is, it about, mm-hmm. is it about creating more features of the product? Is it, I don't know, some, you know, some companies are building product uh, you know, back from scratch sometimes at this mm-hmm. stage when yeah. they want to go globally all over, all over the world. So uh, where, where are you aiming? It's a uh, great question. So... First of all, we do want to continue and invest in what we do today, um, especially around everything around the quality of the conversation. Um, not just because it's uh, the uh, revenue driven decision, but this is the the purpose of the company. And I think um, if we kind of take back it up to the to stage one, um, it, when you find that thing that when you find the thing that you really want to, fight for the vision the vision the, the world, vision the, the mission world, yeah the world the, the better world that you think you can help bring mm-hmm. um, 
you, you can't neglect that. I mean, that is the driver of the entire organization, not from a revenue standpoint, but just from people's energy, from the trust of the market in, in, in your brand. And if you uh, seem to uh, leave it or take a, take a step back from it, the market punishes you, both from the, of the standpoint of, uh, of, of your team um, losing their, their culture and their sense of, of why they want to continue and work so hard, but also from like the, the market's reaction to your, your actions, um, your partner's trust in you. So definitely we want to continue and invest in the core of our, our, our purpose, which is the health of online conversations. Um, but also, we understand that there's a big shift in publishers um, in the publisher space. Um, you may have heard, I'm sure you have, um, about the uh, deprecation of third-party cookies and all of that fun stuff. Um, I think it's a good good sign for us as as users, as consumers. Mm-hmm. Uh, our privacy is more protected, or or is getting to a place where it's more protected than ever before. Um, but it does uh, put a, a big risk on, on publishers who rely on those to actually be able to monetize their content. And as we started with, um, the, the world is headed towards a direction where if you want to successfully monetize, the, the publishing world that, it, that is, if you want to successfully monetize, you have to have a registered, loyal, returning audience that either pays for the money for for the content, sorry, or or um, is registered and and is willing to give their um, data for your um, for your content, and that is the the world that we want to help um, want to help stage. publishers uh, evolve to. Mm-hmm. So if ten years ago when we started, they said, yeah, we we're not dealing with users. We don't. It's not our world. We deal with content and page views. That's mm-hmm. what we care mm-hmm. uh, about. So uh, I think this is the shift that we're, we're, we identified initially. And now we're, we want to double down on that and help publishers uh, register more people, um, under, understand who, the, who their audience is better, engage with that audience, and um, turn um, their platform into kind of a micro social media for them to... For their uh, content. Yeah, for their content. And I think when you take a step back from, again, the, the uh, revenue aspects of that and the business aspects of that and understand where the health of our conversations are today and the fact that it's very hard to distinguish between false and fact. And it's very hard to for conversations to stay at a, um, at a, at a, at a civil tone because who decides what civil is, right? Mm-hmm. Who said that Facebook can determine... Um, where does the the line cross between um, between civility and, and and safety and and between the freedom of speech? And I think the idea that conversations should move from those monopolistic large uh, entities and towards a network of uh, endless number of publishers yeah. that they can host the conversation as they see fit, and I can choose where the conversation fits my um, ideals and values, um, I think is a s- more healthy, um, ecosystem. It sounds great. And it sounds great, um, that you're actually always injecting, you know, uh, healthy and good values into your, into your missions. Mm-hmm. Um, we usually complete our episode with three tips, but I think we can already pull one, uh, that you just <laughs> talked about before. I'll try to bold it out is when you have a real vision of creating something good is like a solar energy. Mm-hmm. It's always there for you. It's, it's always available for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it can fuel your journey, uh, at the hard points, not only the hard points, but always fuel, fuel your journey. Um, give us two more tips for entrepreneurs. Two more tips. So I, I I think one that we also discussed about is genuinity and being really, really honest. Uh, and I think that's something that's almost a lost art in today's uh, social media driven world. Yeah, people forget to be authentic. And sometimes when you're authentic, like you said, uh, you'll have more people around you trying to help 
uh, uh, with a better connection to you. With a better connection and who are <clears throat> also open to be genuine themselves. Yep. And um, when you start to mask yourself, they put on their mask and basically the conversation goes, goes It becomes nowhere. a poker game at the end of the day. Exactly. And it's a and, game. <laughs> and po- poker is like the person sitting next to you on a poker table is your rival. It's yeah, not your yeah, friend. Yeah. Well, um, don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So genuinity is, uh, is another um, big tip. And I think maybe the um, third thing that I, that I think uh, really helped us evolve and, and understand is the understanding that uh, Steve Jobs had that, that phrase of uh, everything built around us was made by people not smarter than you and me. Mm-hmm. So I think when you find yourself, and I was very young when I did, <clears throat> at kind of the, the, the big leagues of doing business in New York, and you see the people around you and you understand this is, I f- like, like we fit here. Um, and having that self-belief that if you work hard, if you understand uh, or, or if you try to, to learn and really um, evolve yourself in that way, then you fit there. And then you shouldn't try to manipulate your way into that table, but you actually have a seat there. Um, and us as, uh, as Israelis, sometimes we... We, we forget that as well, maybe because we have like a, a weird accent or if, <laughs> because our English is not flawless as, as, as the American or polished as, as the Americans are, mm-hmm. um, then then we, we lose track of that. But we're, we all have access to the same information. Um, we are, uh, uh, we're, we're a pe- uh, as, a, as a people, we're hardworking and, and, and bright. And we have the ability to play in the biggest fields that we we want to if we if we um, have uh, keep to our values and and stay uh, strong and, and put our minds into it. Exactly. Thank you very much, Roy, and good Thank luck. You. you know, with uh, the continuance of your uh, journey with Open Web. Thank and you. thanks to all our audience all around the world for listening. Entrepreneurs uh, will be here with the next episode. And you can listen to this episode on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and watch us on YouTube as well. So thank you very much, guys. And see you on the next episode of TLV DNA. Ciao.